So last week we ended uh, the second part of resolving conflict. This is the last part of it. And, and wh where we ended at last, last week was uh, we were talking about how we have to come to a place of evaluating ourselves and really weighing, our, weighing ourselves where we are able to see, okay, where do I need to change and how do I need to uh, trust God more? Excuse me. I was listening to a pastor, uh, some, some form of a preacher, and he was talking about the things that the things that you worry about the, the most are, are the areas where you trust God the least. And uh, I, I know I really connected with that, and I just wanted you to kind of think about that too. Because um, in your mind, you're going to want to think, I don't have very many problems. And that's a bad place to be in. You really want to be in a place where God can really speak to you. So, um, a lot of learning is repetition. A lot of learning is repetition. Uh, when you're talking about the gospel, when you're talking about your life changing, when you're talking about th changing the way you think, a lot of it has to do with... Um, Learning and learning over and over again. This is what happens whenever somebody preaches to you. They, they, they preach something one time, you hear it, and you say, oh, that's interesting. They preach it to you a second time, you say, okay, but I've already heard that. And then they repeat it a couple more times, you think, man, this guy is just really repeating himself a lot. But right around the time that you've heard it for like the 15th or 16th time is when you really start to process it and apply it to your life. That's just how we work as people. And what I'm getting at here is a process that Alvin Toffler um, kind of describes. So uh, if you go to that slide on the screen, I'll read it in case it doesn't show up too good on the screen. It says, The illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write. Instead, it's going to be those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. The illiterate of the 21st century are those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. Especially as we get older, uh, we live in the age of knowledge. I mean, it's at your fingertips, but we're finding that the next generation is surprisingly uh, ignorant of most uh, topics. Even though they have access to more topics than any other generation, they're mostly ignorant of them. Um, they get most of their ideas about the world from, from YouTube and from TikTok. And it just completely changes the way that the culture works and how they interact with each other. And moving forward from here in this tech society we will only move forward in christ and in our ministries and in our interactions with people as we learn be able to be told what to do unlearn be able to try something new and, and to say i might have been wrong and really learn let's do it this way instead i tell you one way that this is applying to me personally is i learned how to be an associate pastor now i have to unlearn and relearn to be a senior pastor it's one of those things where it's, you have to change as you're moving along. So some things you, you, you do for years and years, and then you figure out that you have to change it. Um, I was going to tell the story later on, but I'll tell it now. There was a pastor who I knew um, who he always had the exact same schedule for year after year after year. Every morning between this hour and this hour, he would pray. Every single morning. Well, what happened was he ended up getting prostate cancer. So he had to have his prostate taken out, and when, after they took his prostate out, he became very, uh, I, don't, I can't think of the right word, so I'm just going to say moody. Uh, his testosterone dropped very rapidly since his prostate was taken out. And he found that with the new situation in life, he couldn't follow his old patterns. He had to, in this stage of his life, pray instead of an hour, an hour and a half. He had to change what he'd been doing for years because the situation had changed. And that's what I'm talking about. Learn, unlearn, and relearn. Being able to do something different. So we're going to try a little activity. And I don't want you to say anything out loud so you don't feel stupid or on the spot or anything like that. Okay? I want you to think, just take some time. I'll be quiet in just a second. Let me explain before I get quiet. Uh, think about a relationship that's current or past that you either could have done differently or you still can do differently to resolve it. How could I have handled that better where it would have ended better? Or is there a situation right now that you can handle better than you're handling? And I just want you to think about that for a minute. Likely it won't take long.
Hopefully by now you've kind of thought of somebody. And keep in mind that people types resurface. If you've ha- if you had a problem when you were a kid with uh, your dad because he was too pushy, you're going to find that that same pushy personality type is going to come up all throughout your life. If you had a problem with your mom because you thought that she was weak or whatever, you're going to find that same weak person resurfacing all throughout your life. And it's an opportunity to learn from it. So I want you to, on the back of your notes or at the very bottom, I want you to write down some things that you either could have done differently or you currently could do differently um, in resolving that. We'll take just a, we'll j- just take a minute or two. Sometimes it's the simple things, like uh, just watching what you're saying. As I uh, as I got older, I've given a lot of thought to what really makes someone a Christian. I know the Bible says to uh, go to your faith with fear and trembling. And it's it's one of those things where you have to cross the line of saying, what really does it make, does it take to make a Christian? A lot of us, you know, grew up at a certain time when you had to do this or that. Uh, some of us are real into maybe a denomination. Uh, sometimes people are into membership. I mean, there's all kinds of different things that people get in their heads. But really what it comes down to is calling on the name of the Lord. When you put your trust, your faith, your belief in God. And one of the things you see is Christianity produces a certain type of fruit. For instance, um, it won't take you long of talking to atheists and you hear kind of very similar things repeat themselves over and over again. For instance, many times people talk about Christianity's bad history. And they bring up maybe um, violence towards natives or maybe war with Muslims or, you know, maybe some other, uh, some other area. And in John 13, 35, we see something very important. If you want to go to that slide there, Melissa. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. John here is drawing the, the, line, the, the, the line in the sand, or what, drawing the line in the sand uh, of what it is to be a Christian in his love. We, we build it up with all these other things, but that's really what it comes down to. And so the, the thing that I always think of whenever I hear people talking about people like Jonestown or, you know, once again, uh, the whole war with, in the Middle East back in the, in the medieval days, is just because someone calls himself a Christian doesn't make them one. And if you want to go to that side there, calling yourself a Christian doesn't make you one. It's one of those things where it's like putting a car, standing, standing in a garage doesn't make you a car. You know, uh, going to McDonald's doesn't make you a burger. It's one of those kind of, kinds of things. A lot of times we pride, our, I know I personally do this, we pride ourselves on, I'm a Christian, I got this, I got this. And uh, the more we grow, the more we see, but is my, my love growing? Am, am I changing? And it's a good question to ask. And the idea here is always check the fruit. Always check the fruit. If there's a, if there's a preacher that you like, check the fruit. If there's a, a church that you like, check the fruit. If you look at, your own, look at your own life and check your fruit. And is my fruit good or is my fruit bad? And this is how you kind of learn how to weigh yourself, how to evaluate yourself. You look at scripture, you read scripture, and then you check your fruit and you say, what, what is my fruit? Am I sowing discord and bitterness? Am I sowing forgiveness? Am I serving people or am I wanting to be served? Um, and you see it in little areas of your life. Like maybe if you're, a, if you're a man, you might see it in the way that you expect your uh, kids or your spouse to treat you. Uh, maybe uh, if you aren't married, it's more of how, how you see your place in the world. Um, and, you know, kind of like, how do you treat your dead time? Do you treat it as holy, or do you treat it as kind of like get away, get out of jail free card? Uh, if you're older, um, how, do you, how do you think, what do you think your role is as a grandparent? You know, these kinds of things. Um, you always check your fruit. And the evidence uh, that, the, that the Spirit is working in you, that there is a change going on, was clearly described as in Galatians chapter 5. It says this, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The law is not against such things as these. So the idea here is you can weigh yourself by reading this and saying, okay, so is the Spirit doing something in my life or is it not doing something in my life? Where am I headed? 
you see a lot of times Christians get in these patterns that are destructive, and they aren't according to these things. Infighting. Being unteachable. Being hateful in your interactions with, with other people. Being short-tempered, where you're just always angry. Anything, any, anytime anybody does something, you just kind of blow a fuse. And the thing is here, everybody falls shy. Nobody's going to say, hey, I have my act together. But there's a certain idea of the list where you can see that overall you are headed forward or you are headed backwards. It's like when Paul gives his list of qualifications for either um, pastors or for what now is the board, but they wouldn't call it then. It's not that you're going to find somebody who perfectly attains all those things. And if you compare the lists in the different books, they're not the same list. So either Paul had different lists for different places, or they weren't exhaustive lists. <laughs> and I think if we compare them, we see that there was no standard of this is what the perfect pastor or board member has to be. It's more of, of are you headed in this direction? You know what I mean? So... Uh, one of those things that sometimes we turn it into a thing of just condemning ourselves or others, and it's just not overly helpful for moving forward. So last week we looked at the idea of the five different types of people in your life. And we looked at mentors, teammates, uh, students, also called um, apprentices, masses, and opposition. And we, we mentioned about the way that you had to take care of who you spend your time with and how you spend your time. Especially if you want to be serving people for any long period of time. If you only surround yourself with people who drain you all the time, you're just going to kind of get tired of it. You know what I mean? You're going to get where you, ah, I give up. And uh, you always see people do this. It seems like every pastor friend of mine either is doing this or has been in the past, where there would be like a big problem maker, and instead of pouring into the people who are wanting to grow, leaders do this thing where we, where we get the Savior complex, and we, we, we spend all of our time on that one person that doesn't want to grow, and it makes us, ah, I'm not doing any good, I give up. And it's like, well, maybe you should have just, you know, moved your time over a little bit. And uh, so there on the screen, I have that. Yeah. And then on the next one here, uh, there's going to be two types of people, but aside from those five types of people, there's a different kind of category. There's going to be two kinds of people that are going to irritate you the most in your life. These people are going to irritate you really bad. The first person is people People just like you. There is something in us where when somebody else does the exact same thing we do, we hate them for it. Sometimes it's because we're mad at ourselves <laughs> that we don't get over it, and so we see it in them and just really makes us mad. Sometimes it's because we don't understand that there's something in us. You see people do this all the time where they get married and then they get divorced and remarried and divorced and remarried and divorced over and over and over again because they're looking for this perfect spouse not understanding that they take themselves with them. You know what I mean? There, there has to be a point in your life where you say, okay, these are my problem areas, and I need to grow. I'm not going to get over them by switching out my spouse. I'm not going to get over them by uh, changing my work or changing where I live. I have to deal with me. You know what I mean? You guys are looking at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. There comes a point when you have to weigh yourself and say, I'm taking me with me, and I have to deal with me. Um, I know it's very easy to put it off on your spouse. I'm mad because my spouse made me mad. Well, not likely. You're probably mad because you chose to be mad. That's usually how it goes. And I've found in my own life that people who are most condemning are usually most condemning of themselves. And because they condemn themselves, they, they start condemning you. Now, I tell you this so that you can learn how to cut other people's slack and how you can learn to see your greatest irritations as a reminder that you need to change. When somebody irritates you and you genuinely do not care about them or you, know, you just want them out of your life, that right there is the red flag that there's something in your heart that needs to change. Not that people shouldn't be cut out of your life. I'm not saying that at all. Sometimes you do have to do that. But you have to be careful as to why do I need to per cut this person out. The same kind of person that's going to irritate you is people who are complete polar opposites from you. And as far as I can figure it, as it applies to me, I don't know, this might not be true for everybody, but it's true for me. It's because I want it my way. I want to have control. And when somebody does the exact opposite, it's like, ah, oh, this is exactly the opposite of what I want to happen. 
I'll give you a real good example. I like things nice and tidy and where they go. And I'm having to not have that because <laughs> I'm married, I've got kids, and I'm a pastor. It's not all about me. <laughs> I have to let things go, you know, and it's one of those things where I go and I cry a little bit in my office and then I get over it and I'm fine. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I don't really go in my office and cry. So Proverbs 15.2 says, The tongue of the wise makes knowledge attractive. It makes it appealing to people, but the mouth of fools blurts out foolishness. The mind of the righteous person thinks before answering, but the mouth of the wicked blurts out evil things. You just bleh. And uh, how does this apply to ourselves and, and, and our interactions with other people and resolving conflict? Well, it, it, it has to do with this. You catch more flies with honey than vinegar. If, if, if you always talk to people, you talk down to them, and you're always abrasive, you're not going to really win anything. You're not going to listen to anything you have to say about God. You're not going to resolve the issue. They will not get over their attitude towards you. It just will not go well. And you will not have the opportunity of learning and changing from that. And so sometimes what we do is we say something along the lines of this. Well, I don't want to compromise truth. But the thing is, it's not compromising truth to be wise with how you talk to people. That's not compromising truth. That's being in control of your mouth. But for so long, in, especially in Christian circles, we've got this idea that we can chew people out and just really walk all over them, and that somehow is furthering the gospel. It's not. It's not. People, it's not making people listen to it. It's, it's making people think, wow, this person's kind of annoying. People generally are really great at fighting and being opinionated. That's just kind of our bread and butter. And as Christians, we have to learn how to get along with others, especially today. We live in the most divisive time in human history. Everybody talks about tolerance and tolerance and peace and love. Then you go on online and YouTube, Facebook, they're all the most intolerant things in the world. You say the wrong thing, you get canceled. You, 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 you do the wrong thing, everybody's, th everybody's throwing rocks at you. You mess up one single time, and everybody knows about it, the whole world over, how this person, you know, ah, they did this. It's like, what happened to that whole love and acceptance still, you know? It's just, it only reaches as far about this far, and then once it hits Facebook, it's the end of the line. And so we really have to live counter-cultural. We have to live in such a way where... We are in the midst of a wicked and evil generation, and yet we are living as loving and accepting. And that is difficult to do because those evil people, they're the loudest people. They're the loudest people. So wisdom isn't compromising the truth. We can go on now to Proverbs um, twelve fifteen. It says, A fool's way is right in his own eyes, but whoever listens to, the counsel, to counsel is wise. And this is what separates wise from foolish. I want you to think in your own, on your own life. Do I already always know what I'm doing, or do I ask other people for advice? Think about it. Let's not just read Proverbs, let's, let's apply it. Do I always think that I'm right? Or do I ask other people for advice? Well, I don't think that I'm always right, but I don't ask for advice. Well, then it's the exact same, same thing. It, you're still thinking that you've got it all covered. And once again, this isn't something where I'm saying you guys need to stop doing this. I'm saying human nature is foolish. The only hope for us to not be foolish is when the Holy Spirit does something in us and, and brings us to a place of wisdom. And we literally get dragged there, kicking and screaming. See, what we do is we say, I got my mind made up. Don't confuse me with the facts. I've got my mind made up. Don't confuse me with the facts. The other day I was making, uh, uh, well, Gracie made me some food. And I came home from work, and it was there. She said, okay, it's in the oven. Go grab it. So I go to grab it, and I go to get it off, and it burns my finger. I'm like, ow. And then Micah says, Micah says, like, oh, oh. He, goes, he goes, Daddy, why don't you use a spoon? And I said, Micah, I've been successfully doing this the wrong way all my life. Don't tell me how to fix it now. <laughs> it's a joke. <laughs> it's a joke. Some people that you run into your life, they're going to have chip on their sh chips on their shoulders. They're going to be just waiting for offense. Those kinds of things happen. They're going to be in the church and they're going to be outside in the world. They're gonna ha it's going to happen. When those things happen, remember that you are still accountable for how you act. 
Just because they're acting foolish doesn't mean that you get to act foolish. And what you hear nowadays, there's all these different personality types. Have you guys heard about these? Where you go on and you do like the different quizzes and stuff and they tell you what your personality type is. They have all these different ones like IFJ or I don't even know what they all are, okay? But there's like 16 of them. And then there's the simpler version where it's just I'm an introvert or I'm an extrovert. Or there's these other versions, you know, the something gram, I forget what it's called, Enneagram. I, I forget what it's called. More of the story being there's all these different ways of, oh, I'm this personality type. And what we do without fail is we always say, I don't have to listen to what God has to say about this because I'm this personality type. You, you, we do it all the time with all kinds of different stuff. So it, it really is fine to have your own personality type, to diagnose yourself with all these different things. That's fine. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't resolve issues. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't obey God. That doesn't mean any of that. See, introverts, they don't like talking to people. Here's the thing, okay, introverts, you still have to go and apologize. See, introverts say, oh, no, I, I, people just understand, and I gave them the nod, so that's okay. You know. <laughs> no, <laughs> just because you're an introvert doesn't mean you don't have to go and apologize to people. Extroverts, you see people doing this all the time. Just because you're an extrovert doesn't mean that you don't have to learn how to back off. Extroverts always think everybody else needs to be an extrovert, right? I mean, you guys have extroverts in your life, right? Yeah, we all need to go out and go to this party. We all need to go and get together and do this big thing. And introverts are just like... We all need to do that big thing separately in our own houses, in our own beds with the doors shut. That's just how they think differently. And here's the thing. Introverts don't have to be extroverts. Extroverts don't have to be introverts. But if you're an introvert, you have to push yourself to obey God. And if you're an extrovert, you have to push yourself to back off. Okay? You cannot expect everybody to function on your same level. That's unrealistic. It's just not going to work. An extrovert is someone who draws energy from being outgoing with other people. They like crowds. They like talking to people. They like group things. Introverts like things kind of more intimate and closed off, maybe one-on-one -on -one conversation. They don't like going... They're wor they're, the, the thing that they do the most, yes, let's make those plans. We'll, we'll go out Friday night and go see a movie. We'll get the whole group together. Friday night comes, sorry, guys, I can't make it. I'm sick. Why not? I'm washing my hair. Why not? That's an introvert. An introvert says, you know, I like the whole small group idea except for when I have to go out to the small group. No. Meanwhile, extroverts are like, this is great. I get to talk even more with more people. And my dad is an extrovert, like super extrovert. And I'm a huge introvert. I'm more of the kind of guy for me to have a good vacation. Leave me alone in a room with a book and then have a hot tub outside and I'll be fine. I'll go out at night for the hot tub. I'll go in my room for the day for the book. I'm fine. Really. I'm the, most I'm the, least, I'm the lowest maintenance person you can have on vacation, just as long as I have my own room. If you want me to come out and do, like, group game night or something like that, I mean, I don't think I can make it to that. I got something else going on. I, I don't know what it is yet, but I'll tr I, I have some. Just trust me. I got something else going on. Um, and so my idea here is don't use boxes to limit your obedience. Don't use boxes to limit your obedience to God or your ministry or anything, okay? There, and, and maybe you don't call it those things, same things. Maybe you call it something else. I was talking to somebody this last week, and they were extremely self-conscious because they felt like they were dumb. That's what it comes down to. They had this condition, and so they thought that they were dumb. And I told them, I said, you don't, don't seem dumb to me. You seem like a normal person to me. Like, I, if, if, you, if you think that you're dumb, like, I, I, can't, I can't change that, but I can tell you right now that I don't think that you're dumb. Like, I just see you as, as a person. And um, it was one of those things where, where he limited himself because he saw himself as stupid. See what I mean? We do this in, in our own lives. I'm too stupid to do that. I'm too weak to do that. I'm too whatever. Maybe you go the other way. I'm too pretty to do that. <laughs> whatever it is, you're not. God can always use you. Wherever you are, God can use you. Don't define yourself in this box and then say, I can't obey God because of this. I personally am an introvert, but I still have to take care of business, and I am still a pastor. I just do it differently. I just do things differently. 
Some pastors like to have these, you know, more... Mm, they do ministry in a way that they get to be in the spotlight more, and I'm trying to just do things that work. Sometimes, unfortunately, I have to be in the spotlight to try those things. Eh, but it's one of those things. If you want to be restored, let's change gears a little bit, okay? If you want to be restored, there are three things. Three things you have to learn to, to both be restored as a person and also to restore other people, okay? The three things, I'm going to say them real quick, and then we'll kind of break them down. Number one, secret places. Number two, sacred times. Number three, safe people. Again, secret places, sacred times, safe people. Now let me break this down. Secret places, this is a place where there is nothing distracting you. There's no TV. There's no phone. There's no people. It's just you and God. It can be in your closet. It can be in your car driving to work. It can, well, as long as you don't drive in a real populated area and get mad and start flipping people off, then it's not a good place to have as your secret place. Uh, but anywhere where you can just kind of get alone and just tune into God. Pre- preferably, it's somewhere where you don't have to do anything. I would highly recommend it not be your car because you're still doing something. And it needs to be somewhere where you can just sit. We live in a culture where, where they tell you that if you're not constantly moving, you're be, not being unproductive and it's a waste of time. That's not true. Absolutely not true. The whole idea of fasting is a waste of time. And that's a good thing. It's, it's getting away, breaking your schedule, getting in there with God. And uh, so secret places, just you and God, no distractions. Number two, c- sacred times. These are times of your day, times of your week, Times of your month and times of your year, all four of those things, not either or, that's all four of those things, where you and God have an appointment. And if somebody says, hey, we need to get together on this time, you already have a date for that time. This time of the day is my time with God. It's non-negotiable. This time of the week, it's my non-negotiable time with God. This is my time of the month that I just, me and God, maybe there's a certain time of year. You do all those different things. Those are sacred times. Number three is safe people. Safe people. Safe people are people in your life that pour into you. You cannot only have these people in your life, but you do need these people in your life. Whatever you are, find somebody who does that better. If you're a dad, find somebody who's a more successful dad. If you're a pastor, find someone who's a more successful pastor. If you're a minister, find somebody who's a more successful minister. If you're whatever you are, find someone who does it better than you. Find somebody who's encouraging. Find somebody who's closer to God than you. Find somebody who doesn't always have to talk, but doesn't always have to listen either. Find somebody who knows you inside and out. Safe people. People who you can be real and honest with. I'm having a hard time with this. I started getting into this. It's people in your life. And I see people do this all the time. I have a real good friend of mine. Uh, I don't want to give uh, his name in case anybody here knows him. I, it's very likely that you do know him. And um, he used to live a kind of uh, well, rough life. And he got saved. He got out of it. And he had a slip up. And one of the things that happened is he was running busy, doing all kinds of stuff. But he didn't have people in his corner. And you start to kind of let the safe, pl- the sacred times and the secret places, you just kind of start to let them go. I'm too busy to have my prayer time. My day is too busy to read the Bible. Uh, this, too many things happened. I can't do this. And so then you feel yourself run down and farther away from God, and you're thinking, why do I feel like this? Well, it's probably because you are not making time for God. And the thing about these three things is there's going to be different times, go to the next slide there, different times in your life that will call for different patterns. Okay, different times in your life, you will lean into different patterns of growth. And let me kind of just uh, give you some examples. Maybe you get housebound. You have a surgery, you can't get out of your bed, you're housebound. 
prayer might be, you might lean more strongly into prayer when maybe before the surgery you did more service or reading the Bible more. Um, another example. Um, let's say you're just at a point in your life, maybe you're on certain medication, it's hard for you to focus, maybe you've been through a real rough situation and you just, you feel your, your concentration just plummets. And in that stage of your life, maybe you're going to be doing more service, and whereas you used to read your Bible more. See, different stages in your life, you're going to have to have, different patterns are going to develop of things that you need more. It's like this, one time I was real sick, I got hospitalized for a couple of days, and uh, no biggie. They said I should be dead, but no biggie. And when I got out, uh, I remember I wanted pickles all the time. Pickles every day, pickles and everything. And the reason for that was because my potassium and salt levels were super duper low. Super duper low. Uh, they, I didn't have any. I mean, they pretty much didn't have any electrolytes. I don't even know how my body was working. And that's okay because the doctors didn't know how either. <laughs> they said, I, I, I guess probably if you were to come in maybe an hour later, you'd be dead, I guess. I, I don't know. But, uh, and no permanent damage to my body. Who would have ever figured that, huh? God must have had something else going on. So I was eating those pickles, and I ate them every single day. Pickles, pickles, pickles. I've never craved pickles like I did then. And uh, eventually I got over that. But my point being, in that stage of my life, different patterns developed. Pickles. Before I got my diagnosis last year, I was much more focused. My, it was easier for me to think. Since then, my, my brain is in a constant fog. I can't, I can't think. I can't process caffeine like I used to. I, can't, I get lost in fogs. It takes me a lot longer to process stuff. You know what I mean? So when I'm trying to think of the words for stuff, I'll oftentimes either say the wrong thing or say it in the wrong way. That didn't, never used to happen before. You know, I used to have my thoughts very well ordered. I, I could recall books very well. I could re recall which paragraph on which page a certain quote was from. Not so much now. Uh, a lot of things have changed. It's one of those things where in different times in your life, you learn it, lean into different things. Maybe you're going to uh, go through a period of your life where you're lonely, and you read the Bible more than you would have. Um, I, I hear people do this. They do like this. Well, i I just gotten so lonely. I never used to be like this. Well, I don't want to go to church, though, because they're just a bunch of hypocrites. Okay, well, in this stage of your life, it seems to me like God is trying to get you to lean into the comfort of other believers. See what I mean? It worked when you were younger that you didn't need church. Okay, whatever. You just did your own thing. But then as you get older, God kind of like, okay, well, at this stage of your life, you kind of need to get over it and come on back. And the last thing I want to say before we close out here is uh, there's three books in the New Testament that are all connected. Um, you don't recognize it the first couple of times you're reading it through. But now I'm going to say this, and I want you to go home and read these three books. The books are 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. It doesn't seem like they're connected. But pay attention what John is saying about the church that he's writing to. At first, he's talking about the church as a whole. And then in the second, second John, he talks more about a little bit smaller of a group. And then third John, an even smaller group. And if you listen to the things that he's talking about, he t he's talking about the way that the church is slowly allowing false leaders in. And it's slowly having this decline, this spiritual decline. And the pastor, John, was doing, was doing a good job. He was doing everything right. But the church was still going downhill, even though he was doing his job right. And this is what I'm getting at that. You can't always resolve conflicts. Sometimes, even if you do everything right, it's still not going to work out. Just like with 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. It's not about, I did everything right. It's, they had their own choice. You see what I mean? And so you can make sure that your heart is in the right place. Remember all these things we talked about, the way you're talking to people. Are you making a big deal out of nothing? Uh, are you uh, tr remembering that they're either saved or not saved? You don't have to correct people who are not saved, for instance. Uh, are you remembering all these different things? Are you applying them? But then at the end of the day, there are going to be situations that come by that you cannot resolve. You cannot fix them. And... Uh, it doesn't mean that you are a bad Christian, that you're not obeying God. It just simply means that there are some things that you cannot fix. Everybody in ministry has found this out for themselves.